All right, welcome. Welcome everyone to today's University of Texas Energy Symposium. Uh, before I introduce the scope of today's symposium, I'll point out that um, we're going to have a symposium next week because uh, it's UT Energy Week, and we're going to have Jenny uh, introduce that here for us. Two weeks from now, we will have another uh, UT Austin person, uh, Juliana Felkner from the School of Architecture, will talk to us about smart decarbonization of the built environment uh, in the nexus of climate change, population growth, and technology. So that's two weeks from today. Uh, but next week, if you like to come to this forum, uh, you should go to UT Energy Week, and Jenny Sauer, uh, head of the Longhorn Energy Club, will give us a, a rundown of that really quickly. Yes, hello everyone. I'm also your teaching assistant, so please make sure that you've signed in in the back of the room. Um, so UT Energy Week is all next week. There are three primary events over the course of the week. Day one is an energy analytics event that just went live. Um, day two and three, Tuesday and Wednesday, are the part of the week that the Longhorn Energy Club has put together. Um, we have several really awesome keynotes. Um, the former public utility commissioner, um, Paul Hudson, will speak. He's the person who was heavily involved in the deregulation of ERCOT's market. Um, we're having the assistant secretary of the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, um, who's it's part of the DOE. He's going to give a lunchtime talk on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, we're having a keynote from Walmart's VP of Energy and Facilities Management. And then throughout the conference, we're exploring all kinds of macro trends related to geopolitics, <clears throat> critical minerals, um, fuels of the future, and many topics. So I encourage all of you to Google UT Energy Week. Um, it would be good if you would register. It's free to register. We have lunches, we have meals, networking receptions, there's a student research competition. Um, but if you want a name badge, please register. It also helps us track. Um, and then on Thursday and Friday, Tijogol is having an event as well, which I don't know very much about, but it's good for lawyers. And there's not as many women in the room, but we are having a women in energy breakfast on Wednesday. It is open to male students, so if you'd like to come to that, maybe send me an email through Canvas, um, and we'll get you signed up. And you on the, on the panel, we would love to have all of you as well. Okay, thank you, Jenny. All right, so today's forum is kind of a like a podcast where you can ask the podcast person anything, except here you can ask anything, roughly speaking, about energy of the six of us here on this panel. So before we get started, I'm going to introduce the students who have helped me organize this and who are going to be facilitating taking questions from you. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand so they can bring a microphone to you and ask a question. I'll introduce the students, and then I'll have the panel quickly introduce each of uh, the panelists, quickly introduce each of themselves, uh, and then we'll get started. So I'd like to thank Sangeetha Kumar, uh, and I have this rotating uh, slide on the screen. She is uh, co-president of UT chapter of ASHRAE, uh, Society of Heating and uh, Refrigeration uh, Engineers. Uh, uh, she's a PhD student studying civil engineering, so we have graduate student help. We also have two uh, undergraduates with the help helping here. Richard Matthews is a senior in mechanical in or chemical engineering. Uh, he wants to pursue a career in artificial intelligence, and he's founder and president of the Texas Solar Energy Group. Uh, here in Austin. So thank you, Richard. And we also have Carson Tharp, uh, who is majoring in uh, senior undergraduate, majoring in international relations and global studies, uh, the minor in business, and he's part of uh, energy organizations, including the Longhorn Energy Investment Team. So, uh, so thank you to each of you three. Uh, and now we'll just briefly introduce who we have here uh, as panelists so you know what question you might be able to ask of them. We have uh, excellent expertise here. Um, I'll start with myself, Carrie King, uh, background in mechanical engineering, uh, assistant director and research scientist at the Energy Institute, and I've studied electric grid integration and uh, macroeconomics of energy in the economy. So kind of a systems, systems thinking about energy in the economy. So. I'm David Spence. I am a professor of energy regulation at the law school and also at the McCombs School of Business. Um, Carrie has billed me on the slide as uh, someone involved with a website called energytradeoffs.com, which I would invite you all to go look at, uh, which is, it addresses issues associated with the trade-offs and value choices that we have to make if we're going to make a green transition in a relatively short period of time in the energy sector. Um, and most of my work is, all my work is about regulating the energy industry, both the oil and gas side and the electric side. Um, I'm David Edelman. I'm sorry, I've got a cold today or just getting over a cold, so I sound like a, a little bit like a frog. Um, 
I'm at the law school. I do predominantly environmental policy. I would say some technology policy, mostly in the climate change, clean air space. And I'm Sheila Olmsted. I'm a faculty member at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, which is UT's public policy school across campus. Uh, I'm an economist, and to the degree that my work focuses on energy, it focuses mostly on kind of environmental impacts of energy supply. And um, I have some experience also in the public sector in that I spent a year working as senior economist for energy and environment at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, under, starting under President Obama in 2016 and then uh, in the first five months of the Trump administration. Too. I'm Larry Lake. I'm a professor in the uh, department, I'm sorry, I have to do this right, the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. I've been there for 40 years. I teach uh, classes and do research on reservoir engineering and something called enhanced soil recovery. I'm Suha Vorka. I'm a research scientist. I'm not teaching faculty, but research at the Bureau of Economic Geology, which serves as the Texas Geologic Survey. I'm a geologist, so send these other people there's policy and economic questions, because I know about the technical aspects of especially, particularly carbon sequestration um, in the geologic setting. Um. Thank you. So raise your hand if you have a question, and can you the first question? Yeah. Go ahead. Should I just go ahead yeah. and ask yeah. them? So, so actually, I, I, I thought about someone asking that question. So, so I brought a citation that, that, that um, you know, people say glibly all of the above, but when people do a serious assessment, for example, um, the, the Princeton study, now Pascala and Sokolo in 2004, um, they, they divided the carbon abatement into sectors, and they said seven wedges, starting small and growing bigger and bigger. Um, and that's that, you, that one approach, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, my, my research can't possibly deal with the whole problem. However, taking, uh, nor can um, wind or solar or, or um, in, any sector, any sector can't, can't effectively deal with the problem. Um, it takes a number of technologies applied, which is the interesting policy aspect, is how you're going to commingle different technology approaches in a way that um, is effective, optimized. Um, so it's not a trade-off. It's not pick one. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's which one it's, are you going to match to which, which problem, which, which technology is the, is the approach. When you do a study like the um, International Energy Agency uh, um, does these um, IAMs, what's an, an integrated assessment model where they do scenarios with as much economics as they could put in it um, to look at what would happen if we incentivize this or that. They, they get optimization by commingling um, consistently, and that's in the public domain. You know, you can take a look at their assumptions and see that, that it's not one or the other. It's pick, pick from the pick from the portfolio. Can I also just chime in on that? So um, from an economic perspective, one of the things that will drive that is the relative costs of the different approaches. It's not the only thing, right? Political feasibility and all these other things are important too, um, but relative costs. And so even economic models, even before there was you know, as much work as there is today on carbon capture, could show that the optimal mix of things like um, you know, sequestering carbon in soils through changes in agricultural practices or in forests through afforestation or reduced deforestation, that those practices were really important parts of the portfolio of cost-effective approaches to climate change when you kind of stack them up against emissions mitigation. And so adding the sort of technological uh, approaches like carbon capture 
my guess is exactly what Dr. Fork has said, that you know, as the, especially as they become more and more cost effective over time, um, that just becomes a more, more and more important part of that portfolio. So I would say sequestration has always been right, an important part of a cost effective approach. We haven't always taken those cost effective approaches right, in that optimal portfolio. <coughs> Um, but we certainly can um, can see that it's an important part of the um, the picture. Can I say something too? So, um, uh, not every one of my comments will be an advertisement for the website, but we have a conversation. <laughs> we have a conversation with Sheila that touches on some of these issues that I think is really uh, instructive. But the other point I would make is um, we can do things now that foreclose opportunities later if we, choose, if we choose the wrong policies. And we're really bad about predicting 20, 10, 20, 30 years out what's going to be cheapest, what's going to be competitive. And so I would, I would hope that in our political choices we don't rule things out that might ultimately be part of a really good solution that people can afford and, and is reliable later on. Um, so I've been looking at carbon capture and sequestration um, sort of the geologic form that Dr. Horka does um, for a while. And one of the interesting things is it seems like the kind of opportunities for utilizing it have shifted over time. Initially, it was viewed as um, an answer to mitigating emissions from coal fired generation. But as the price of wind and solar have declined dramatically, um, it seems like less and less that's going to be the predominant use, utilization for it. Um, it may be used in conjunction with natural gas generation, and there's some new um, capture technologies that are very, very efficient and really, really interesting and promising associated with natural gas generation. Um, and then maybe in the longer term, people are talking more and more if we are not able to reduce emissions as rapidly as we would like or we would hope um, that we will have to basically suck CO2 out of the atmosphere, so capture it, ambient CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequester it. Um, and you hear more and more people, even though that could be quite costly, um, that the, the downsides of not doing that will you know, overwhelm the cost at a certain point. Um, and so I think, I think it's, it's shifting in terms of how we're thinking about industrial utilization, so using carbon capture and sequestration on industrial sources, it's also likely to be really important there. But kind of the portfolio and the timeline for deploying it, I personally, I think that's kind of shifting. Yeah, I think I'll just add that carbon sequestration is, to me, a tad different than, say, renewable energy in the sense that it's clearly something you would do to address the climate, whereas wind or solar power could be done for economic development reasons or just providing more electricity. Uh, but, you know, putting a billion tons of carbon dioxide in the ground uh, a year is uh, clearly a set of infrastructure targeted towards climate change. And I guess, we, you know, in some sense, the economy hasn't shifted to, <coughs> yes, we need to prevent climate change versus I'd like to just focus on things that I think are best for my business or growing the economy. So it is a, uh, it is a, a trick. And uh, as, as David Edelman said, uh, there's some new technologies in natural gas that might be just as efficient as current natural gas plants, but can uh, essentially uh, separate the CO2 uh, for the same cost. And then the actual injection part, the actual geologic part, is, is uh, a relatively small fraction of the total cost of carbon capture and sequestration. So uh, if something like that works out, then it could be more feasible to use natural gas, and it's roughly zero carbon or close to it. Um. Many econ economists are arguing that an escalating carbon fee is one of the most cost-effective uh, climate policy solutions. Um, what are some of your thoughts on this and maybe some of the downsides to an escalating carbon fee that may not be so obvious? <laughs> Softball. <laughs> yeah, um, um, so, you know, one good example of such a policy is the proposal by the Climate Leadership Council. It's hard to say, you know, whether that's the right magnitude or whether we should be... So their proposal is... A $40 per ton tax that would kind of cut across all sectors of the U.S. economy, and then the revenues from that tax would be taken in and then redistributed at the end of each year to individuals on a kind of per individual basis in the United States in the form of a rebate. Um, and you know, 3,500 plus economists have signed on to that. I have, not to say I might 
I might take a higher tax if it was politically feasible. I might take any tax if it was politically <laughs> feasible. Why would thousands of economists, including you know prior CEA chairs of both economic persuade or both political persuasions, prior Fed chairs of both political persuasions, have signed on to that kind of a policy proposal in such large numbers? Well, the reason is because exactly as you point out that it is the most cost-effective approach to reducing um, you know carbon emissions. And it is absolutely unbiased as to how that is achieved, whether it's achieved through you know, investments by industrial emitters in carbon capture and storage, or investments by electricity generators and in increases in wind and solar, or investments by consumers in smaller vehicles that are more fuel efficient. Right? It, just, it will cut across all of those kinds of choices for energy production and consumption. And so we really like that, because what it means is that firms and households and individuals will be sort of choosing their own least cost method right, of, reducing, uh, of reducing emissions. Downsides that people talk about are things like it increases energy costs. I, this is one of the most frustrating things sometimes that being an economist in policy settings <laughs> is that you have to explain to people that it is energy regulation of all flavors. Um, you know, subsidies for this, you know, you know, refunds, rebates for batteries for electrical vehicles, um, you know, cafe standard, every energy policy that we implement essentially raises costs in some way. A lot of them raise costs for energy directly. Others are more diffuse, right? They're sort of subsidized on something, then you're increasing taxpayers' right, taxes to support those kinds of subsidies. So everything has a cost. We don't achieve any of this without incurring costs. And there's really good research showing that some of the approaches that we have on the books are not only much more expensive than what you would see with a, with a carbon tax in that range of, say, 40 to $50 per ton, or 60 to $70 per ton if you could get that high. Um, but they're also at least as regressive as a carbon tax would be. So CAFE standards are a good example, right? CAFE standards are corporate average fuel economy standards. They raise the fuel efficiency, average fuel efficiency of the vehicle fleet in the United States through policy, right? There's high, lots of debate right now about the, the, the standards that are in play right now. But in general, those kinds of policies um, have a kind of cost per ton of carbon emissions that's much higher than what, you know, $40 per ton, for example. And in addition, they hit low-income consumers more hard than they hit high-income consumers. That's the nature of a, of a regressive policy, right? So relatively more expensive for a low-income household than for a high-income household. So those things are already out there. And when we increase energy costs, that's a regressive practice. With a carbon price, you generate revenue um, with which you can correct that regressivity if you want to. And, and the rebate program that is the part of the proposal of the Climate Leadership Council does have that the sort of nature to it, that it, this rebate that they propose is progressive in the sense that it will be a larger share of, of income for low-income households than it will be for high-income households. So that's the point, right, is, is energy regulation can be and often is regressive. But we do not get to from point A where we are now to point B, which is a stable global climate without energy regulation. And so let's design some policies like a carbon price or something else, right, that is more progressive than what we've seen so far. Follow on, maybe it's another question for you, Sheila, or comment. So for the carbon fee and dividend concept, this is a progressive policy in the sense that low income users get the same rebate as high income users and they would tend to spend that money more. So how does the economic literature see that that would actually, is it clear that that would actually reduce emissions? If you have more spending power that's to low income question. people, yeah. is this, are they just gonna buy more? Yeah, and actually, this actually increases, it's not obvious a, to me that that's No, no, you're right, happen, and it's right? not obvious to anybody. And in fact, that is a question that I got multiple times in the White House, right? Even sort of policymakers in the position to make these choices <coughs> want to know the answer to that question. And what I would say is, it is definitely true that when you increase people's incomes, which is essentially what you're doing with this kind of lump sum, kind of get a check at the end of the year rebate, that the consumption of all goods and services could increase, right? Some of us will put some in savings, others will right, put it in your college tuition savings or your retirement account. Others will spend more money on things, including energy. And what I would say is that as long as that incentive is not, like if you took it and you said, well, a low income household is just gonna pay a lower fee, or we'll rebate them on a per unit of energy consumed. That would mess up the signal, and that would result in sort of eating away the benefits, directly eating away the benefits of the carbon price. There is clearly going to be some kind of an income effect, right, from this rebate program, but no studies suggest that that would be a really significant sort of eating away at the, in, the, the effect of that marginal incentive provided by that $40 per ton tax, because again, you know, you might know you're getting a rebate check back at, at, back at the end of the year, but you still are looking at your electricity bill and your gasoline bill, right? And you're saying, 
I want to reduce those expenditures. They've gotten more expensive for me. And so that response doesn't go away simply because we, we send people a lump sum rebate at the end of the year. And that's just a really, really important point because you're right. You don't want to have this kind of leakage, right, where you just create the problem that you, that you were just trying to solve. Can I add one? Um, so David and I have done some work looking at the electricity sector. And, and the one, one worry I have, and it's much more kind of a political worry, is that um, if you look at a carbon tax kind of north, much north of 20 to 25 bucks, would just have an enormous impact on the competitiveness of coal-fired power plants, which are already suffering. Um, and so you, I think you would need to be careful in the way you implement it to allow for a reasonable transition. Um, because one of the, the, the virtue of a cross the board carbon tax is that you're gonna be taking advantage of the cheapest opportunities for reducing emissions. The downside if, is if there are huge variances in how that carbon tax is gonna be felt, you could really disrupt certain parts of the economy. So like a carbon tax that across the board looks really attractive could actually disrupt the electricity sector if implemented in a, in a kind of ham-fisted sort of way, mm -hmm. um, especially given that coal is already kind of teetering. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy about, personally, about driving coal out of the market. The market is already kind of doing that on its own. Um, but there are obviously you know, economic and political considerations that you would have to take into account in how you would implement it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's a fair point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please just go ahead and keep your hand raised too so we can bring the mic microphone to you as the next question. Uh, I would really love your thoughts on the normative statement that LNG is part of our future energy mix and not. I would love it if you can cater to your carbon emissions in your business with natural gas. Actually, I, I need to take a shot at that. You know they're giving away natural gas in West Texas now. So, you know, people have to pay people to carry it off. And so their only direction for that, at least in the near term, is down in price. And so people all over the country are taking advantage of this low price to build chemical plants, mm -hmm. to build LNG plants and things like that. So, so I think it's going to be a strong transitional fuel. And if uh, an operator doesn't take advantage of that, he's just a fool. We're just one administration away from that. <laughs> <laughs> See if we can get all those questions that were asked. Something about countries, who's taking LNG, and what's that role? There's a domestic question about <coughs> U.S. producing it and exporting it. We're only one exporter, and I think there was a second question in there. That, that middle one is super quick. Yeah. Um, the answer is, you know, so now we're, we are already exporting quite a bit, actually much more than we were before. Well, first of all, so it used to be illegal, and then there were no ports, right, or no appropriate facilities. Now we have them. Exports are going up. Prices are starting to come kind of closer into alignment. I think more European and North American prices than, than uh, Asian, because I think we're still more competitive in, in European markets than we would be in Asian markets. But over time, like, you know, even if there hasn't been a big effect, you know, over time, we would expect to see those low, low natural gas prices in the US, like even right, giving it away or flaring it right, or whatever, um, would start to come up. I think the studies that I've seen would suggest the effects would be fairly small, even for a fairly robust export market. But um, that's what I, from what I understand. So, so um, the initial question about transition fuel versus destination fuel, which I hadn't heard. I, for some reason, I've not heard the phrase destination fuel before, but it um, makes sense. 
Um, what I was trying to say earlier about not ruling anything out, and, and David Edelman's comments about advances in carbon capture technology associated with natural gas fired power plants, I don't know the an I think none of us know the answer to that question. But if natural gas uh, on a life cycle basis can be a net zero contributor to the electric generation mix, why not, mm -hmm. right? So uh, upstream, there's still a lot of methane leakage that happens in, uh, usually in, it's isolated in sort of really high emitter types of facilities, but it's, you know, it's still there and it's not really being controlled. I think part of that is a function of politics and part of that's a function of how decentralized the industry is. I think some of the big players want to do it. They want the rules that would force sort of the equivalent of caulking your windows to sort of fix a lot of that leakage. Um, and so when you're questioning about administration, I think we have an unwilling current uh, uh, presidential administration to regulate that kind of stuff. Um, but I, th I don't see any reason why, we, if we keep our eyes on the prize, which is emissions, not fuels or particular fuels, then um, I don't see re any reason why natural gas shouldn't be allowed to compete in, to, in that environment, uh, particularly when as intermittent resources become a bigger and bigger percentage of the electric generation mix and there's more need for that really short-term balancing function and it'll become a lucrative business. Um, you know, batteries might outcompete natural gas for that business, but let them all let them all play, is my view. The gas has to be carbon mitigated. Sometimes people forget that, that, that tw coal has twice the carbon load per B for BTU, as they used to say. But gas isn't, it, you can't get to two degrees with un, un, without mitigating the emissions from gas. Now, uh, less work's been done on mitigating the emissions from gas because so much of the focus, as, mm -hmm. as David said earlier, was uh, the idea of federal investment or international investments have been on coal. Um, but um, that's slowly being corrected and with this net power um, alum cycle discussion and others, um, it's, I've heard people from chemical engineering saying a gas to gas handling method should be uh, a better than a solid to, solid to gas handling method, you know, should open some doors, um, which haven't yet been opened. So we're asking for the you know, the technology to swoop in and save us on, on handling uh, emissions reduction from gas. It's, it, it's been often said that after combustion, um, you know, gas is more en uh, energy intensive because it's more de uh, uh, conventional gas cycle uh, produces a more dilute CO2 stream. So the separation is more expensive, more energy intensity, greater parasitic load. So you've got to do something that we don't have in, in our um, mat in our mature kit right this minute, but um, to mitigate the gas, the L making LNG is also from from uh, pipeline gas is also an energy fairly energy intensive business with compression um, um, and uh, and the refrigeration you know, that they that they put out quite a, have quite a carbon load that they burn their own gas to, to as a parasitic load to make the product. Also interesting is they have a pure CO2 stream. They they can't ship the C, they can't ship the CO, the natural gas um, at pipeline purity. Pipeline purity is two percent CO2, um, so they have to reduce that so that they don't get CO2 ice in the product. Um, so they have a pure CO2 stream, which is really interesting right now to to do experiments with under 45Q current methods of management. So they might be early movers. Just on the LNG market, I don't follow it too heavily, but there's plenty of potential demand just in China or India alone for taking a lot of natural gas. And I guess from a domestic perspective, as Larry said, it's, it's hard to imagine it getting cheaper than it is now. Uh, essentially, it's coming from people trying to get oil. So uh, this is, if, if there is an environment to put a tax on carbon and have natural gas be a part of the mix going forward over the next several decades, it doesn't really look any better than right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so,
voting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm, that's glib, but that's probably right. Yeah. I mean, um, there's not much appetite in the Republican Party right now to do that. Um, I was, at I was attending remotely a conference actually on Sunday in which uh, someone presented research uh, about, um, in which she went into a, a fossil fuel, in this case, coal dependent community and interviewed people. And um, we live in a world where people have sort of different realities and, and beliefs about what's true. And in that world, um, they had a lot of beliefs that were that really needed to be changed in, the, uh, in a really fundamental way before they would even think about uh, policies that would reduce emissions. They thought climate science was a hoax. They thought that if you turned off coal-fired power plants, the grid would go down. They thought a lot of things, and um, she was, they weren't gonna hear it from her, but those were wrong. And so the presentation was about how, how do you change those perceptions, and that's a really long-term mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Can I just add, this is maybe a hopeful note and might be cra sound crazy, but I haven't been here in Texas that long, so I'll go ahead and say it. But um, one thing that fascinates me is that, you know, Texas is very much about markets and letting markets do their thing. And if you look at what has happened in Texas' electricity market, I think you can only describe it as a sort of shining example, right, of what can happen when, you know, you introduce competition in electricity and right, in the electricity market and you make some public investments in transmission that allow renewables to compete. And we have this incredible amount of penetration of renewable resources on the electricity grid in Texas. And when you go to Washington, D.C. and you talk to people, they're shocked because Texas, like, is a leader of litigation against, you know, against the Obama administration on something like the Clean Power Plan. And so people assume that this is the kind of place where it must all be coal-fired power, it must all be dirt, you know, they love their dirty fuels in Texas. The answer is no, actually, right? When these things compete on the margin, they're gonna take the least cost, right, uh, generation technology, and they're gonna put that on the grid to the extent that they can. So. I do feel that the current political environment, right, one can be really pessimistic, but it does also feel like if the window is open even a little bit, right, these market-based approaches are gonna have exactly that same kind of impact that, you know, dramatically reduced costs for renewables had, you know, back, you know, a decade or two ago, and nobody predicted that, and nobody would, you know, even know, many people don't even know today, right, that Texas has that kind of renewable generation, um, because they assume, you know, that the political environment here would stop that, but actually markets, will out. And so if at the federal level there were some, you know, climate policy that was put in place or if like there started to be some serious consideration at the state level for approaches that would work, I think these market-based approaches could be a good sell in, in that they're kind of conservative in their origin and that's how I would sell it. <laughs> so that's that's my hopeful. Note. You already see that with uh, yeah. the a a energy around uh, <coughs> intensity of investment and in about um, yeah. 45 key yeah. tax credits. Yeah. People are very so, excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's the tax credit that you can get for, for sequestering carbon um, in, uh, um, has generated, it only, it's, it, the maximum is $50 a ton. So it's not uh, something you would do capture from uh, u electric utility it's, mm -hmm. or some source that's higher concentration already. Um, and especially a pure CO2 stream from um, are nearly pure, that you're just going to compress and dehydrate is very attractive economically. Uh, so there's, you know, it's a, that's, so that's a small pool. It doesn't leak out into the very large pool of carbon emitters, but the people in that small pool are, are very interested, including um, some extremely, uh, um, what shall I say, anti-regulation, mm -hmm. pro-fossil, um, you know, people who are very strong believers, you would not think would be first movers, mm -hmm. but when, when the target is, is in dollars per ton, uh, they are able to change quickly. Very much, <laughs> very much. <laughs> I totally agree with the, um, oh, do you wanna go ahead? No, 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 I was looking, somebody okay. was asking. Um, I totally agree with the, the, mar the ERCOT market being this kind of shining star. California is doing it one way through regulation. Um, Texas is doing it through uh, competitive market and investment in infrastructure. And I think that's not only a model for Texas, that should be a model for the country as well. Where you have the economics at your back, you should leverage those as much as possible. And I don't think we necessarily need to be thinking in terms of command and control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the transportation sector, I think, is really interesting. And I think we're getting to a point where market dynamics um, 
will push things, like even with buses, the economics are looking more and more attractive right now. And so the policies that you might put in place are ones where you do have some you know, tax breaks that get people kind of over you know, all the sort of reticence they have to adopt what seems like a really foreign technology. Um, or, you know, looking, focusing on fleet vehicles and those sorts of things. Um, and the co-benefits that you were talking about with regard to air pollution are enormous on the transportation sector. Most urban areas, the predominant source of pollution is from the transportation sector. So there are a lot of co-benefits that would go along with that. Can I add one more thing? So I think your question mentioned uh, deep decarbonization. Um, and I would agree with everything you're saying about uh, the market, reducing market barriers, allowing the cheapest technology, which are right now wind and solar, to, to outcompete the, the older technologies. And I think that's going to continue for a while. But that will hit, it'll hit a point where it won't continue, right? So yeah. when these, tech, these wind farms are competing against one another and their capacity factors go down, the economics gets a lot worse for them, um, then, we have, then we need some sort of top-down solution to get the, to the rest of the way, if we want to go the rest of the way. Um, and I think that's, I'm not, I think we have a ways to go before we get there. And we, can we found we can integrate these resources much more easily than we thought we could, and there's been a bit of a cry-wolf problem on that issue. But, but at some point, we're going to hit that, that, that point, and, and then it's going to be policy-driven, or have to be policy-driven. Right. So um, I remember during the State of the Union, uh, President Trump mentioned something called the Trillion Trees Initiative, and other like representatives and senators from the GOP have mentioned things like a new Manhattan Project and a new like a Green Real Deal. What would the scope of like solutions proposed by the Republicans and more free market oriented uh, politicians take on compared to the more regulatory approach proposed by AOC and Senator Elizabeth Warren? I would just clarify that, like the Green Real Deal, those are not free market approaches. <laughs> that, that I wouldn't categorize them as that. A carbon price is a market approach, as would be cap and trade. That's another one. Um, even some of the subsidies and so on the, are, are market-based approaches. But these, you know, picking sectors and choosing, you know, technologies and so on, those are not uh, market-based approaches. And there's something between those two alternatives that you mentioned: the House Environment and, or Energy and Commerce Committee has a discussion draft of a bill out that uh, has a clean energy standard in it, um, which would be a cap and trade type of thing. Um, and and uh, I don't know anything about the Green Real Deal. Um, Green Real Deal. What's a Republican alternative? With oh, is it? Similarly it's catchy name. Exactly. Um, but, but I think, you know, there are in between, there are moderate sort of approaches out there. They just don't seem to get as much attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I had the weirdest experience visiting China who has I don't know anything about ch policy in China, but um, they evidently have some strong mover for coal, coal producers or coal users to plant trees, because every highway in in, in Mongolia, in, um, which is a ga grassland steppe, is every highway has this band of monoculture trees planted yeah. along it. It's the oddest looking thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I haven't seen a study. I don't know what it's good for or whether they survive or what happens to them, but it's peculiar looking. <laughs> yeah, I, saw, I saw that in China, too. Yeah, China's got a top-down approach for if you tell them to green the, green the countryside, then it looks pretty, they'll green the countryside. It, does, it looks pretty stupid, another. like this band of trees right <laughs> along every highway, and, and that's right. good for what? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the only thing I add, which is not maybe specific to any <laughs> real proposal on the on a green real deal, but <clears throat> I think most people who might discuss that are maybe pushing back against a renewable only future and saying, no, there's carbon capture and nuclear and we need to promote those. So that's probably the distinction I drive, uh, find most between if someone puts real in front of new deal versus just green. You know, it's like one of the more controversial forms of like. I'm, I mean, the, the challenge right now is the cost is so high. Mm -hmm. You, like every once in a while you hear um, promising information about um, the small modular reactors. Um, and I heard something just recently that suggested that they're farther along than at least I had heard before. It's hard to imagine like the large-scale nuclear 
um, unless we can do what South Korea has done, which is actually really driven down the cost of construction and the construction time. But <clears throat> just the development times of, you know, technological advance in the wind and the solar sector, and especially the solar sector now um, with storage, is so fast. And it's just really, really hard to keep up with that with large-scale projects like nuclear. So um, if they can drive down the costs, um, maybe the small modular reactors are an option. I just, it seems, it's like one of those things like um, fusion. It just seems, always seems like a decade or two away. You might have to bite the, what we're going to do with the spent fuel issue too, which is yeah. complex. And you know, the, the last success was just, was just, that, you know, completely the whip, whip plant, writ, or the new Nevada site, yeah, and Yucca so things Mountain, are Yucca Mountain, uh, Yucca Mountain all, all uh, site, you know, invested, 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 gone for political reasons. So. The company that David's referring to is called New Scale, N U S C A L E, and they have a project that they think they're going to build in Utah. Uh, so it's being sponsored by a municipal utility that goes by an acronym U A M P S. I don't remember what that stands for, mm -hmm. but they apparently are quite close to getting the final approvals. That might be what you're referring to. Yeah. And um, if that gets built, then we'll see, you know, if these little small modular reactors can contribute. Yeah. So the only, I guess, takeaway out of the nuclear is that current technology is the problem is it's big, and the second is it costs a lot. So uh, if you can make it small and cost a lot, then you only have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but when you're uh, in a country that's not. <laughs> Uh, in the United States, you're not really increasing electricity consumption at as rapid rate. Anything that's big to build requires some certainty about filling that demand in the future. So big is sort of hard now, and most of the things getting installed are in smaller increments, which is wind, solar batteries, and natural gas plants are just, can just be installed in smaller increments aside from their, or in addition to their uh, low cost at the moment. But the deep decarbonization, yeah, most people looking at it, even at the current cost and design of nuclear, to get to a really deep decarbonization you, that would still become a technically feasible or economically feasible option when you get really uh, low carbon. So a lot of what you all have been talking about in terms of the renewables and then the um, automotive and transportation sec uh, sector going electric with all of that is really underlying or undercut by the battery situation. Um, and in particular, uh, where we're going to get like cobalt and nickel to make like the amount of batteries, um, you know, with like London wanting to go completely EV by 2050. Is that a, is that like a phantom talking point that people are putting out there or is that like a legitimate thing? And are there some battery technologies that are like kind of, as you were saying, like just down the road that are going to make the cobalt nickel kind of issue um, less of an issue? We had a uh, Nobel Prize winner in the building next to us who probably should be answering that question. He was the inventor of the lithium battery. Uh, he keeps saying there are other things that would be better than lithium. It's kind of like the uh, statement about always in the future, though. It seems like it's always, it's always in the future. But another take is, is that uh, we, we haven't seen just an enormous demand for these rare earth minerals. And there is very, very good possibility that they're not so darn rare, you know. And uh, if there's a market, uh, we might be surprised at where we could come up with it. I would just add to that, too, that one of the reasons that economists often like the idea of a, a carbon tax that goes up over time, not where just it would happen randomly, right at times when it was politically feasible, but that you would adopt something like now, that would say, you know, in 20 years and 30 years, right, this is, this is what the fee is going to be and it's going to escalate is because those kinds of price signals give people incentives to develop exactly those kinds of new technologies, to look for new sources of rare earth minerals, right? Companies that have to invest in those risky kinds of endeavors need to know, right, that there's going to be, right, this kind of, that we're going to price the emissions such that these other technologies are going to be uh, cost effective, right, that there's a reason to go after them. So... Again, I know that says a little pie in the sky. I guess this is not a policy that's under serious consideration. But the more we know about how costly it will be not to have those technologies in the future, the more likely it is that those technologies will be developed quickly. I also think as the scale of the market goes up, just that yeah. in and of that's itself true. is yeah. going to absolutely the amount of investment is going to go up really just dramatically. 
Um, I've heard really kind of conflicting things. Like, you know, some people seem to say, um, you know, there may be, there may be points in time where there's a lag between supply and demand, but overall there's, there's more than sufficient supply. And then there's other battery chemistries that are in the works and not too far off. Um, so I think it's really, un there, it's one aspect that seems kind of unpredictable, it seems. Yeah, I'll just add one thing on that, aside from you can't predict the future. Um, if, if, you know, if oftentimes a person, I, I would say a person might come with a semi, say, anti-renewable slant on rare earth minerals or maybe talking about batteries, yet not put the same argument towards fossil fuels. And they say, mm -hmm. we'll always find more fossil fuels. Well, make up your mind. They're, they're both sort of fossil minerals in the ground, and either we're going to get better at finding all of them or worse at finding or depleting all of them. So uh, you kind of have to think about it both ways. But, yeah, it's difficult to know if it's the number of chemistries. The same thing in photovoltaics. There's a number of chemistries, and if one gets restricted for some reason, then there's, there are many others. It's actually a fabulous example because we certainly have gotten better at finding and extracting oil and gas resources <laughs> over time. I thought, I thought the non non battery energy storage was was quite interesting. I, I like the story that Net Power was telling about needing since it's oxy fired. Net Power is saying it's an oxy fired technology. So there they so if you overbuild your oxygen tank, then you do the expensive separation when power is cheap and store effectively store that as store that energy by cheap tanks and. And it seems like there's um, yeah. once you once you know that there's a big value in that there's might be lots and lots of um, uh, opportunities to to do these um, non-battery storage that in a niche, but add up to, the niches might add up to because lots of people have tanks, you know, mm -hmm. it's a um, or other equivalent things you could stock when when energy prices were cheap, so. Yeah, just thermal storage. UT has yeah. massive thermal storage tanks that allows us to time shift our, our demand. And my understanding is those are really uh -huh. you know, very cheap. You, you know, uh -huh. if you've got the land and you've got some scale, they're really attractive. Thank you. Going off of that, um, are there new uh, technologies to be able to recycle or repurpose these used EV batteries, especially now that the older PEV uh, cars are going off the market? Are we able to repurpose them for microgrids, for example? First question. And then the second question are, uh, is related to the standards of EV charging technology. We don't yet have the standard for charging cords that are able to do managed charging. Uh, we have other technologies at the, at the base charger, um, but is there a future that we could look to, and what can we do right now to manage uh, these high loads for battery electric buses, for example? Anyone on this? I think maybe we're not the best panel for the EV yeah. question, but yeah. in terms of recycling or reusing, I, I guess it would just make it seem we're not very good at recycling. Well, we're at some things, steel and aluminum, but as far as complex uh, designed objects we sort of haven't hit the uh, I, I saw hit, a lab, hit the limit of actually doing that on a large I saw scale. a lab at Total that was trying to he's saying yeah this is a bad problem that is all these uh, c complexly combined um, constituents recycling or disposing safe mm -hmm. disposal was a coming thing and they were working you know thinking they might be early movers and how to get value or make an industry out of that. If Dave Tuttle were here, he could answer the first part of that question, I think. Um, the, uh, I'm told by him <laughs> that, uh, that the warranty on your EV battery only, you know, really cover, is quite conservative. It covers like two-thirds of the actual life of the battery. So your question's a good one, which is there's probably value that can be extracted from that if there were markets to, to do it. And uh, I just don't know the answer. Yeah, I think you pointed out the most likely next use, which is to, for grid uh, capabilities, which aren't as uh, stringent for power flow uh, needs, aren't as stringent as for an electric vehicle. And the question is whether, yeah, that's, a, that's probably just a good, a good engineering task for someone to integrate different types of batteries that already exist out there and find a way to combine them, or we just have to wait until there's an accumulation of a certain standards, standard size. But 
yeah, I guess we're, we're not there yet. And I don't know, yeah, perhaps Dave Tuttle knows sort of the, the numbers of vehicles that would start to really transform and be uh, uh, reused, or at least have their batteries reused to, to work on the grid. But that the, the, seems to be the most likely next use of them. Um, thank you. Uh, so right now the switch to low carbon uh, seems like gradual, uh, but when I talk to my friends they all say there, there's going to be some sort of disruption at some point. Uh, from your point of view, uh, is this disruption going to come from um, social or uh, policy or economic um, sources? Because, I mean, as a young person there's protests all the time but nothing sort of happens. Um, or there's uh, things like carbon tax that are proposed but don't really get implemented. So I, I want to hear your take on that. I, I mean, I have my, my own view is that one of the reasons that we have seen this kind of relative stasis, at least in the U.S., kind of political system, um, and frankly even some of the kind of international agreements and the history of those international agreements and whether countries actually meet the goals that are set in those agreements, um, we've really fallen short right, uh, over a period of many decades um, in both domestic and global efforts to do something about this problem. And one thing I often think is that um, at least until the, say, late 1990s, um, it felt very theoretical when you know, concerned politicians would talk about climate change or scientists would talk about climate change. Um, it felt like this is something that's in the future. But I feel that increasingly it's something that um, I mean, we all were experiencing it, right, in the sense of like the, being the frog in the pot of water that's on the stove, right? But, but now, right, we see increase, you know, increases in extreme events, not all of which obviously can, it's very hard, right, to, to attribute those um, specific extreme events to climate change. But it gets harder and harder to explain why they've occurred as such the magnitude, like, you know, uh, heat waves in Europe and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, exactly, like heat waves in, in Alaska and so on in the absence of climate, you know, we, it's, they're so, so much less likely to have happened without anthropogenic uh, uh, climate change than they, than they are with it, um, <coughs> that it just, as that list gets longer and longer and as people, not just in, you know, kind of Bangladesh where um, countries like that might not have a lot of sway in terms of trying to push other countries toward um, action, as they happen increasingly on the U.S. southeast coast or the you know, coast of the Gulf of Mexico or the drought in California right back in uh, between 2011 and 2015. Um, my feeling is that the pressure to, you know, to do something, unfortunately there's a long timeline between anything we might do today right, and mitigating some of, those, um, some of those kinds of effects, but it feels as though as we experience more direct impacts um, that maybe somehow, right, that creates more pressure for um, more of a constituency for change. But I don't know how to answer the broad question about whether, you know, something, you know, I don't think any climate scientist can tell you with certainty that there is or is not going to be an abrupt threshold in any particular part of the climate system. Um, that, right, these tail kinds of events, that's exactly where the uncertainty is such that we, we can't, right, they, people, that, that's the problem with those events, right? We can't say when and where they will happen, even if they, if they will happen. You just um, want to stay away from them. You want to stay away from them. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I need to say something here, since we're getting toward the end of the hour, and I, there won't be too much rebuttal to this, right? <laughs> First thing is you two ought not to ever sit close to each other. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Second thing, uh, uh, I've gone to Indonesia several times, and every time I fly into Jakarta, it looks like the whole island of Sumatra is on fire. I mean, it really does. I haven't been to China nearly as many times, but it's always polluted. Some days it's very, it's very polluted, and some days it's just not so polluted, and they're very happy about how clean it is. You know, the, those folks are not burning those palm leaves in Indonesia for the purposes of creating smog. There's a pretty strong leap between energy consumption and prosperity. So, and if you are on, low on the radar screen in terms of prosperity, it doesn't resonate much to you to save carbon if you have a way to uh, raise yourself out of that, uh, out of that, uh, that trough. So, uh, as we have all these discussions, please remember there is a trade-off between prosperity and the things we're talking about here. U.S. can probably afford it. China maybe can't afford it. 
but uh, I almost gave Kerry a, a slide to show. I have a plot of, uh, of a, a normalized gross domestic product versus uh, energy consumption down here, and it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good correlation. So the more yeah, you could argue what's cause and effect, but the more you consume, the more prosperous you are. But the most striking thing about it is when you group these countries, 180 some odd countries out of the CIA fact book. Remember, they're up to date and they spy on you, oh, right? So you group these countries way down here at the <laughs> tail end is about 20 African countries. We're going to tell them to cut back their, their energy use when they're so far down the, uh, that doesn't seem very moral to me. So our, our, our message has got to be nuanced for this sort of attitude. We're good for talking about the U.S. and Europe and in China, but there are new nuances worldwide that, that don't get addressed very often. So anyhow, are we out of town yet? <laughs> uh, now we got time for people to rebut. Go, no, I'm not going to rebut that. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to sort of offer some evidence in support of Sheila's semi-optimistic uh, statement about the future, which is if you look below the national level in the United States, let's assume we want things to happen in the United States that address the problem, which I think was probably part of your question. If you look below the national level, there has been a lot of activity lately. There's been, I think, six or seven states just in the last, say, year and a half or two that have established really aggressive climate or clean energy goals or emissions goals related to the energy system. Uh, not just California, which has been at it for a long time, but um, Hawaii, uh, Washington, Nevada, New Mexico, New York, uh, several, a couple of others. Um, and they're not all sort of the pure blue states either. So, I think as time goes by, and as sort of the younger half of the Republican Party, which supports action on, to take uh, action against to address climate change, sort of moves up in age and becomes a bigger part of the population, I think we're going to see more ground up, groundswell of, of desire for government to take action to address these sorts of issues. It may not be a national policy anytime soon, but um, but I think. I, I feel long-term optimistic. Whether it's fast enough, I don't know. But, um, but I feel like the momentum uh, in public opinion is going in the right direction. I will say one thing, maybe a little more philosophical, theoretical level on this disruption and rate of change. Uh, myself and a few colleagues like to think of the economy as a superorganism in the sense of an evolutionary organism. And biological organisms are the genetics change and mutate, and they're tailored for a certain environment. And what we're discussing here is if we change the environment, it could be physically climate change, but economically, if you change the environment versus via a carbon tax or some carbon restriction, then there's a certain subset of the economy that's in some sense ill-adapted to that. Um, and in addition, markets are effectively kind of like uh, evolution. They're, they're telling businesses with their technologies to compete on marginal changes, not, not dramatic changes. They're telling them to, to target incremental changes and evolution targets incremental changes. It doesn't look forward. It's not forward-looking. There's a random mutation. It either works for the environment or it doesn't. If it works, mm -hmm. the, the, the organism survives and passes on those genetics. If the mutation's too big, uh, the organism's not fit for the environment anymore, and we don't observe it. It doesn't pass on its genes. So any or organism or economy that changes too quickly for the current environment, economically speaking, uh, could in some sense make itself less fit. And if you make yourself less fit and don't survive until tomorrow, you're not there to affect tomorrow. So there's always this, in some sense, challenge or pressure to survive till tomorrow, which means compete now, which may not necessarily be reduce carbon emissions as much as possible. Can I just say, I just want to reflect on, on Larry's point. Larry, um, I, there's nothing to refute in that statement. I mean, I, what, the only thing I would say is that, one, um, the fact that there's such a strong link between energy production, consumption, and prosperity makes it all the more important to find a way to do that cleanly. And two, where we see in countries like China and India people taking to the streets, it's not about climate change and pressuring their governments to do more about climate change. It's about the co-benefits question and the fact that you know literally hundreds of thousands of people in those countries die every year prematurely due to exposure to things like fine particulate matter and you know, other uh, air pollutants that are correlated with, not perfectly right, just to get more of it from coal than you do from natural gas and so on, but correlated with, um, with uh, fossil fuel combustion. And so... My view, right, is that precisely for that reason, right, for the, because, right, these countries have, have reached a level of development at which people, 
have enough capacity to pay attention and say, look, I, I don't, we can't, I, I don't want to live like this anymore. I'm making all these, I have to keep my kids home from school, I have to buy air masks, I have to buy an air filter for my apartment, I leave town right at certain times of the year because it's simply not livable. Um, that what is what I think will cause, the, sort of precipitates the change in those countries, not pressure from the United States or, you know, pressure, internal pressure about, about mm. climate change. It'll be about these local air quality concerns, which are um, absolutely, uh, in terms of premature mortality and morbidity, a greater acute concern than climate change for those countries. I'll say to Larry that I don't like it. Larry's particular statement is a, a, a tad in the direction of the false choice problem. So. Uh, totally like to go there either. I guess I'm agreeing with Sheila, I think, in general on that point. So we'll go with uh, maybe one more comment here. And yeah, building on Sheila's comment there. What can the scientific community do? And why is it not more outraged that the general public has no very little support for climate change and when the leadership basically denies any facts? So why isn't the scientific community out there enraged I mean I think some of them are yeah. I think there's yeah, I think so some too. of them but, are but I not as a movement I don't see anything with movement now the good thing is we may have Bloomberg who's at least emphasizing the climate aspect mm -hmm. I think it's a great question what I would say is what a shame like that we put that on scientists right who are supposed to be finding the answers to some of these key kind of technical questions that could get us out of this jam um, and not lobbying right their political leaders to listen to them. So a right, what a shame, a shame on us. Um, but b, I, you know, I, again, my I take the optimistic view, you know, and having again operated for a short time, period of time right in two administrations that have very different perspectives on this <laughs> issue, um, that the best approach is that kind of patient you know, be there with your analysis, have it, constantly put it in front of people, really, right, train students to constantly put it in front of people, and the window will open. We know that, right, at some point, right, you know, we won't have, right, a president of the White House who, who says China, you know, climate change is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese, and, right, so that is the political situation now, that changes quickly, you know, I wish there were more pressure to, you know, to make that change, um, but, you know, I'm hopeful. Very true. It rephrase the question uh, recording. It's a, it's a question about um, environmental, social governance, investing. If you're, if we kind of have a globalized economy. I'm throwing that in in terms of people that have money to invest around the world. If they can get a better return on investing in fossil energy in developing countries versus ESG investing in developed countries or whatever the opportunity is, um, is there is there some sort of conflict? And is ESG sort of uh, a real thing here to stay? Moving moving forward, going to move the needle on carbon or maybe anything else, or is it just people out there just trying to find the best bang for the buck and maybe 10% of it goes to ESG and they're really making their money elsewhere. I've heard, I've been to one conference where it's financing people who are, help invest for, let's say, high net worth, high net worth individuals will say uh, finance has no moral compass. They just, there's the, there's the environment of investing and they look for the return and they go for it. There's China in Africa too. China, yeah. China, yeah. China selling coal fired right. mm -hmm. power plants in Africa. Mm -hmm. Hot they're, topic. Absolutely. They're buying it, buying it from us too. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> there was the recent um, statement by BlackRock, which is like the largest. What is it? It's a hedge fund. It's a hedge fund, yes, yeah, a private equity um, fund. And so I, I think there's. I mean. Their, my understanding is that they were disinve disinvesting in, whole, in coal and oil and gas was a little more ambiguous. But that seems like a really important start. 
if you look at the apartheid movement in the 1980s, um, there was a big divestment movement associated with that. I think the challenge is the energy sector is so much more vast and integrated into the global economy. Um, and so... And the investments are so long-lasting, yeah. right? So that if we're building, if Chinese are building coal plants in Africa today and the U.S. is building coal, you know, coal plants in Africa today, even decades from now, right, those damages will be... Help. Yeah, continue to unfold. I mean, you know, I think this pieces out into a lot of different possibilities. In a country like the U.S. or in countries like European countries, wealthy countries, essentially, there is a market for green products, right? And you can go, you know, I'm an Austin Electricity customer, you can pay a little bit more per month and you can get, you know, um, you know, green um, power. And so those markets exist if, I mean, we're all buying electrons, but if I can differentiate my product and, and find the greenies, right, and label, label it well and it's, there's somebody backing that up, right, I can, I can sell a cleaner product even if it's a little bit more expensive. Um, there's also the investment side, right, which is to say, if you know, long-run investors in projects like coal plants think that that poses a risk that it didn't before, because we could even have some kind of regulatory regime that makes it less appealing to have those, or makes it so that they can't function as cheaply as they did before, um, or frankly, because you know we think you know we're going to hit some sort of abrupt you know change and 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 make all those things you know seem like uh, a, a technology of the past. Um, then that can change people's behavior. But I think one of the big challenges is sort of, uh, you know, Larry's earlier point, which is, look, if it's coal or nothing, right, then I'm going to choose coal, right? If I'm, if I'm trying to, you know, increase electrification and, and increase the amount of electricity that's available to, you know, rural people in my, my poor country. And so that's where it's a little tricky. Now, if we said, well, you know, BlackRock's just going to pull out of those projects. There is a downside to that. The downside is that people have a less less electricity consumption, and that affects their right affects their um, their health outcomes. It affects learning. It affects right all these other things. And so, it's not as if there aren't trade offs. Um, you know, which is why you know the initial approaches at the international level. You go back to the 1990s, where you know developed countries are going to make the reductions and you know, developing countries don't have to do anything. Well, that doesn't work out because India and China right now are right among the world's largest emitters. They weren't maybe back in 1990, but they are today. And we all knew that back then. But the sort of moral questions really weighed in, right, on those negotiations. And that's what we end up with. So now we have the framework from Paris that says everybody has to do something, right, but let's find ways of transferring technology, find ways of uh, creating funds, right, sort of global funds to make it easier for some of these poor countries to adopt, you know, get themselves, set themselves on a lower carbon intensive path than they would otherwise have done when the only option was, you know, kind of coal or nothing. But it is, there is a trade-off at that end of the scale. You're right that if what you need is electricity. It doesn't have to be fossil generated. Um, but if that's the cheapest technology, right, um, it, it can be awfully hard to move away from that in the absence of some regulatory interventions, some assistance, you know, that drives down the cost of these other technologies um, in that particular setting. That's a really hard problem to solve. It is really why we don't have, I mean, it's one of the primary reasons we, we don't have a successful global climate agreement today, um, right, in, in the sense of having set targets and timetables and having countries, you know, achieve those targets and timetables. Would you say, so you had, your question was about ESG, would you say that ESG is neither the solution nor nothing? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, there so are that's investors, how I feel about it. yeah, there yeah. are investors, there are consumers, right, yeah. who all have willingness to pay, take on additional uh, When BlackRock you know, exits, that changes marginally the availability of capital. Availability yeah. capital, and when, when, who's the guy that you yells at You mean there has to be some money oh, transfer yeah. somewhere? Jim Cramer. Right. Jim so Cramer says he's, uh, the oil is yes. a bad investment yes. now. Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> But uh, <laughs> so I couldn't think of his name. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think it has marginal effects, but it's never going to be the solution. I agree. Yeah. Right. So we're short. If you have a very short question, we'll take it. But this has got to be the last. And wait for the microphone. Wait. Wait for the microphone, please. Hi. Um, do you think in countries like China and India, which are developing quite fast? Is it possible to build renewable energy at such a large scale, especially when the population is much, much more than that of America? You want to take that? Well, isn't it, I mean, isn't it advent in places that don't have a grid and are, and, and are not electrified? Some people have at least made the case that uh, renewable might be actually a better solution. 
uh, because if you can plop it down there quickly and cheaply compared to capital intensive big uh, power plants. Yeah. But if that's that's the choice of some electricity versus none. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't speak. I can't speak as well as some of the other people here to the to the other question. I'm also aware that you require generating to produce wind or solar the much more than that of the fossil fuels that we have. And you mean land area? Yeah. 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 Actually, I have to adopt that. So, a question I, I, about population density and land area. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think it's definitely more of a challenge in India than probably say China or the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is China easier. Than, huge land the area. U.S. is easier than both of them, just from a density standpoint, as you say, and the quality of resource. China has great, uh, pretty good quality resources as well, but I think India is probably more of the challenge from the pure land standpoint. Yeah, but, uh, but nobody's pressing those limits yet. But, well, and but, you yeah. have to make investments in moving the electricity from where you can generate it with wind and solar to where it's needed in the cities, which is often not. And it has, it wasn't here either, right, in Texas. But we made those investments and have benefited from it. So. All right. So I'd like to thank the panelists. Give a round of applause for the panelists coming here. Thank you very much for coming. Good job.